Hello and welcome back to German Grammar Pod. Today we're going to be looking at cases, in particular the nominative case. A case is a way of showing what role a word is playing in a sentence. In English we do this with word order. So in the sentence Peter ate a shark, we know that Peter is doing the eating and the shark is being eaten because Peter was the first word and the shark was mentioned after the verb. In German, however, you can show which way round the sentence is happening by the case. This shows up in the form of any determiner you use. That's words like a, the, this, some and my. The ending on any adjectives. The form of any pronoun. That's words like I, you, me, we or us. And in some cases, in the form that the noun takes. In our example, the only determiner, adjective or pronoun is the determiner A before shark. So we have a choice between the sentences Peter hat einen Hai gegessen Peter ate a shark and Peter hat ein Hai gegessen A shark ate Peter. Actually, technically that second sentence should have been Peter hat ein Hai gefressen because German uses different words for people and animals eating. In German, people essen and animals fressen. One native German speaker I know told me she gets an image of the animals sitting with a knife and fork and a napkin if people use the word essen when they're talking about an animal. But the PowerPoint images for the YouTube video are too much fun to pass up for this particular example, so I'm using it anyhow. Back on my examples, despite both having the same word order, as we just saw, the first one means Peter ate the shark and the second one means that a shark ate Peter. In fact, to be doubly confusing, I could have it the other way round. Ein Hai hat Peter gegessen, a shark ate Peter. Or, Einen Hai hat Peter gegessen, Peter ate a shark. The reason that that second sentence also means that Peter ate the shark, not the other way round, is because in German, markers of case, that's the form that the determiner you've used takes, or the ending of the adjective, are more important signalers of a word's role in the sentence than the order in which the words come. This is particularly difficult for native English speakers because firstly you need to know how all the adjectives and determiners change in all the cases. Secondly, in some cases you need to know what gender a word is in order to work out what case is being used. And thirdly, it's been argued that if your native language relies on word order to show the roles of words in an utterance, this is what your brain will always automatically look for in all languages, and you will always have to make a conscious effort to check for other markers like case instead. That all sounds pretty difficult, but in practical terms it's not generally that difficult. Most of the time, German uses a similar word order to English in sentences, so, the person or thing doing the action comes first, and the person or thing the action is done to comes second. The main reason that a sentence would get turned around the other way is for emphasis. We can do that in English too, but we'd add in extra words to show what we were doing. So, for instance, we could use the passive and say, A shark was eaten by Peter. Or, we could restructure the sentence and say, It was a shark that Peter ate. German doesn't need to do this to put the shark in first position. It can just use its case system to show who was doing the eating and who was being eaten. When you first start learning German, the chances are that all the sentences you come across will be in the same order that an English one would be, in terms of personal thing doing the action first, personal thing that the action is done to second. At this point, it's mainly important to know that the cases exist and know what they are for rather than being able to use them correctly, as this explains why determinants and adjectives can have so many different forms, and explains why there are two different words for me. It takes quite a bit of knowledge, including the genders of the nouns you're using, to be able to use the cases correctly, so I would advise not worrying too much about trying to use the correct case in your sentence until you've been learning for a while. Later on, it will become more important to be able to use the cases correctly, and I'm about to give you tips on how to do this. Later still, it becomes important to remind yourself to check whether the cases used match what you were expecting from the word order, or whether they're a different way round.
Personally, I found that this mainly became important after I'd left university and become a translation checker. German has four cases, the nominative, the accusative, the dative and the genitive. All nouns you ever come across in German have to be in one of those cases. Today, I'm only going to look at the nominative. I'll be covering the other three cases in the next three podcasts. The nominative case is the one you find in the dictionary and the case you'll be taught first for any word where Kate's makes a difference. That's mainly determiners, adjectives and pronouns. The nominative is the case that you use for the person that's doing the action. Most sentences, and certainly every simple sentence, like the sort you learn when you're just starting to learn the language, will have a nominative in it. The simplest sentences generally take the form nominative, verb, accusative. For instance, Ich esse die Wurst. I eat the sausage. Er liebt Cora. He loves Cora. Or, Peter hat zwei Brüder. Peter has two brothers. In English, one of the few places you can still see the remnants of a case system is in the pronouns I and me. Although English is not considered to have a nominative case, the word I is generally used in English where a nominative would be used in German, and me is generally used where one of the other cases would be used, particularly the accusative or the dative. So, as a rough rule of thumb, this means that if you could swap the noun or pronoun you want to use for an I in English, you should be using a nominative in German. For instance, with the sentence, Peter ate a shark, you could make that sentence, I ate a shark. So you know that you should put Peter in the nominative. On the other hand, you would not say, Peter ate I. So you wouldn't put shark in the nominative. I'll come on to what case shark should be in next time. But, two words of warning. Firstly, just because a sentence doesn't make sense with a person doing the action doesn't mean that one of the words is not in the nominative. So, just because I closed at five o'clock doesn't make much sense doesn't mean the shop in the shop closed at five o'clock isn't in the nominative. Secondly, there are also some places where German uses a nominative where English would or could not use an I for various reasons. For instance, the nominative is used when addressing people as in the Herr Schmidt of Herr Schmidt, Telefon für Sie, or Tag, Michael. Also, there's a set of verbs that you use the nominative on both sides of, i.e. nominative, verb, nominative. Those verbs are sein, werden, bleiben, heißen, and scheinen. That's to be, to become, and also would and will, to stay or remain, to be called, and to seem or appear. Examples of these are Ich bin Einzelkind. I'm an only child. Thomas bleibt mein bester Freund. Thomas remains my best friend. Sie wird Lehrerin. She's going to be a teacher. Ich heiße Laura. I'm called Laura. Er scheint ein furchtbarer Chef zu sein. He seems a terrible boss. One final place in English where you'll find the nominative in German, where you wouldn't find one in English, depending on the English speaker, is in sentences comparing one thing to another. So in English, many speakers, including me, will use sentences like He's bigger than me. She's better read than me. As opposed to He's bigger than I. She's better read than I which is what other speakers of the language would consider to be correct usage. In German, however, this is not an area which is subject to difference of opinion at the moment, so there's no debate as to correct usage. German always uses a nominative in this position, so you get Er ist größer als ich. He's bigger than me. Sie ist belesener als ich. She's better read than me. So, how does the nominative show up in the German language? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you see it in determiners, adjectives, pronouns and nouns. I'll start with nouns because they're easy. The nominative is the basic form of the noun. It's the form you'll see in dictionaries, so there are no changes to this form when you use a nominative. Indeed, German nouns don't usually change when they're in different cases. So this is actually the form you'll see most of the time. 
except in some instances, which I'll talk about in later podcasts. With pronouns too, it's pretty simple. It's the first form you're likely to have learnt of them, so... Ich, meaning I. Du, meaning you in formal singular. Er, sie, es, meaning he, she, it. Wir, meaning we. Ihr, meaning you in formal plural. Sie, meaning you formal. And sie, meaning they, are the nominative personal pronouns. It would take a very long time indeed to go through every example of the nominative case for determiners and adjectives. So for now, I'm going to stick with the examples I think are most useful. I'm going to run through all the examples in the order masculine, feminine, neuter, plural. By the way, in case you were wondering, the plural doesn't change depending on the gender as it does in some languages. I'll also provide a table on the website sites.google.com slash site slash German grammar pod. There's a link to it on my blog in case you get to that one first. So, my first key example is the word a. This comes out in the nominative as ein, masculine, eine, feminine, and ein, neuter. There's not a plural version of this word for obvious reasons, but if we take its opposite, no, as in no rabbit has ever been known to dance the conga, as opposed to no, I won't do that, then you end up with kein, masculine, keine, feminine, kein, neuter, and keine, plural. After ein or kein, the adjectives decline with the following endings. er for masculine, e for feminine, es for neuter, and en for plural. So you get ein alter Mann, an old man. Eine alte Frau, an old woman, ein altes Bier, an old beer, and keine alten Männer, no old men. With the word the, it's a bit different. The masculine, feminine, neuter and plural of the are der, die, das and die. And after a the, all adjectives take an e as their nominative ending, except after the plural, which takes an en thus distinguishing itself from the feminine form. So you get der alte Mann, die alte Frau, das alte Bier, and die alten Männer. So, to sum up, where English uses word order to show you who's doing an action and who it's being done to, German uses cases to give you this information. And it shows you which case a noun is in through any determiners, words like the, a and my, any adjectives that precede the noun, or any pronouns. German's word order is often the same as English, with the person doing the action coming before the verb, and the person the action is done to coming after it. But it doesn't have to be. The nominative case is the case that the person doing the action will appear in. It's also the case you'll find in a dictionary. You'll find a nominative in most sentences. Mostly, there'll only be one nominative per verb, but the verbs sein, to be, bleiben, to stay, werden, to become, heißen, to be called, and scheinen, to seem, all take a nominative on both sides of the verb. It can sometimes help you to work out which noun or pronoun is the nominative if you try swapping it with the English word I. However, be warned, this is only a rough rule of thumb and won't work for every nominative. Well, that's it for this time. If you'd like to see a transcript of this episode or relevant tables, you can visit my website at sites.google.com slash site slash German Grammar Pod. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me at germangrammarpod at yahoo.co.uk. You can also subscribe to the German Grammar Pod podcast through iTunes or by visiting germangrammarpod.blogspot.com or watch videos of these podcasts on YouTube. Next time, I'll be talking about the accusative. But that's it for this time, so it just remains for me to say thank you for listening and goodbye.